What's up, guys, and welcome to Table Talk. My name is Doug Polk. My name is Joe Ingram, a.k.a. Joe Ingram 1, a.k.a. Puppy. Well, welcome, ahead, everyone, to the show here today <laughs> for our first episode. That was great out of the gate. For those of you that are not familiar with the format, here's how it's going to work. Every topic will have a, an amount of time. The timer will be located in the top right beneath Table Talk. So you can see, or beneath the, the subject matter, so you can see how much time is left. When the clock expires, a bell will ring indicating that we are moving on Ding. to the next subject. Yeah, we're going to be uh, doing these live every single Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And after they're live, they'll be on either my YouTube channel at joingram one or Doug's channel at Doug Polk Poker. All right. Correct, Doug? Correct. Yeah, Doug Polk Poker. Okay. On that note, let's go ahead and jump right in. You can introduce us to our first topic here today, Joey. Doug, I'm very excited for this first topic. I'm just excited for the show. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in live. Thanks, for everybody, watching this back. Our first topic is a very legendary player is back in the streets. Gus Hansen has been spotted back playing poker. He recently did a poker news interview with my buddy Frank Opord, where he talked about how he took the last two years off. And he was in allegedly in the music business, I believe, in uh, over in Denmark. I don't exactly know what that means. Yeah, what was he back... doing? Listen, I, I don't. I, I, I watched. I read the interview. It's a long interview. It's on Poker News. Check it out. You know, they talked about what he, he used. To, what has he lost before? He lost twenty point seven million on full tilt poker before it went down. I don't know about you, Doug, but I feel like that's a lot of money. And I don't know how much money he's making from backgammon. You know, I know he sold a company, Poker Champs live tournaments i don't know that seems like a, can you think he's gonna come back play poker online again and keep losing money at that sort of rate or well, do you for, feel like he's been in the lab working on his game getting better <laughs> studying poker I, I don't know what do you think well first off there's no chance gus hansen was in the lab zero percent chance okay second off this was only a matter of time at some point gus hansen was gonna get back in the mix i mean you look back at all of the money he lost, and it usually would go through like a little spurt, and then a little, you know, little, little time off, little mm -hmm. spurt, little time off, and then he finally threw in the towel. But a lot of that, I think, was because full tilt poker went down. Like if the one K, two K triple draw, or what was it, two K, whatever those like nosebleed triple draw games were, if those were still running on full tilt, it's hard to imagine Gus Hansen being able to stay away. That makes a lot of sense. I think he even talks about in the interview how he played these super long sessions. His table selection was poor. He played really long sessions. He, I mean, you're not going to win using that strategy. And do you think we're going to – I mean, I don't think we're going to see a different approach from him. I'm sure he took a couple years off. He might have made – who knows how much money in the untracked back room backgammon yeah, games? Yeah. Also, the backgammon thing is interesting to me because everyone always says like, "Oh, Gus got all of his money from backgammon." Mm -hmm. uh, I hear the term like Saudi princes. Whoa. Where are the backgammon games at, man? How do we get in the back? Do, do you actually, I mean, do you, do you know the rules of backgammon? I don't even know what backgammon looks like. I, you, you know get what it, it looks like? I have no. I don't know. Should I know? I mean, I, I don't really know the rules, but I, I do know that part of the game, and I could see Gus Hansen loving this, is at some point you can, like, take your position or double the stakes or something. Either you win the game or the stakes double or something. It, it, I don't know, it's a sick game from what I know. I really don't know much about it. But the question is, how much backgammon money is there? Seems like I, a I ton. I've never met anyone that played backgammon in my entire life. I've never even seen Gus Hansen play backgammon, but you, that's been the story for the past, it feels like, 13 years they've been talking about these high-stakes backgammon games that Gus Hansen plays. So so maybe we can find out. You know what, Doug? I'm going to make it my mission to try to get him on the podcast. Nice. I'm going to try to get Gus Hansen. Now that he's coming back, I don't. we don't know how much he's going to play, though, because I, I don't know if we've really seen him in this past week. I don't know if he's going to be doing it in spurts or whatnot. But he did, even, my, even during his time off, he did do a little bit of like jumping into the Zoom pools. I, yeah, I, I, he, play, I play a little with Gus Hansen. Allegedly, his account was spotted playing a little 2-5 PLO, the great game. I saw him in the, oh. in the Zoom pool there, so, I mean, I don't... Do you, think it's any, <laughs> do you think it's any chance that there was, like, some cross-booking going on there? I feel like uh, if you see someone like Gus Hansen playing 2-5, like, there's something going on. Well, from what I've heard, I, I hope not, because I don't know if he was necessarily a very uh, plus EV player in that pool, but... <laughs> I don't know, man. Listen, I'm ex I'm just excited to have more Gus Hansen in my life. I, I, I love his, uh, you know, I love his personality. I love his aggressive style, and I really hope that he sticks around. Him and Isildur might battle a little bit some of the high stakes mixed game tables, and um, 
we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Moving into our next topic here today, Poker Stars announces more rake back yes. changes. Things are continuing to get better for everyone. It really is quite fantastic. And actually, what really annoys me about this change is it's kind of like when in 2015 they screwed over the SNE players. This was a lot more of the same. They waited until October or November to announce the changes, leaving a lot of people that work to get Supernova, admittingly not as tough of a thing to attain as Supernova Elite, but leaving a lot of those players kind of left out to dry. Some of these changes even include a monthly recurring point total need instead of an annual one, mm -hmm. uh, really trying to put the squeeze on these players, and of course also lowering the effective rake back percentage to something along the lines of 28%. Also announced in the changes, Stars Coins now disappear after a certain amount of time, six months, I believe. You gotta protect, you gotta protect the recreational player Stars Coin balance. What, what do you feel, Joey? Is this a good move from Stars? What are your thoughts on this? What's going on over there? Okay, so I think the one thing I feel like a lot of people missed out on that announcement they put out, and by the way, come on, they, they, it's, it's the middle of November and now they're bringing these announcements out. So inactive stars coins, let's lower the, it, rake back's gonna, it's gonna change. It's, you have to get it every single month. So instead of 100,000 VPPs, now you gotta get 120,000 throughout the year. But they say in there that this is only, they're gonna announce a new rewards program. Meaning I believe is that what it is now will be eliminated. Have you heard about that? Uh, can, can you expand what exactly? Okay, so here's what I'm taking away from that is okay. that when they when they said this will be how it is until the new rewards program comes, I believe what they mean is that they're getting rid of the program as it is now and they're going to announce something brand new. Brand new. So that's why, yeah, so some people were speculating that's why they went to this monthly thing. So that way if they eliminate the Supernova program in May, it's okay because right. no one will be able stuck with it. So there's going to be more rake and it's gonna be better. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, the, the point is, this is another move from Stars that's questionable. You know, they just launched the beat the clock format, which seemed like another, like, let's take the skill out of poker. Mm -hmm. and, and man, I gotta say, it makes me a little bit sad because I remember back in the day when people would argue, poker stars are full tilt, what's better? You know, and then poker like stars. some guy in the back would be like, hey, what about UB? And then everyone would be like, shut up. No, but anyway, the point is, Poker stars are full tilt. What's better? And I was I was a stars guy, man. I, I, me in the, the poker stars leather jacket. There's a picture of me on the internet. I'm just like in my poker stars leather jacket playing some NL25 pumped because I loved the brand. I loved the software. I loved poker stars so much. Took care of their players. And to see what's happened in the last year or two to stars, it breaks my heart, man, because they were the golden boys in the online poker game. I think here's the problem. At the end of the day, whenever someone starts to have like a monopoly within within you know any field, and Stars has a majority share of p poker play on the internet, you have problems because they can make shysty moves and not have to pay the price for it. You know what, Doug? I think this all traces back to one person, and that's David Bezoff. It's, I think it just all goes back to him with the insider trading stuff coming out, and now these allegedly is making up this. Three billion dollar backing. What was I mean, that? I it pretty that. much all goes back to to David Bezoff coming into our lives, coming into Poker Stars lives, and that's sort of where all these things started, just going downhill. For for those that don't know, uh, Bezoff announced that he had the backing of many companies or many firms to purchase Poker Stars for three point six billion dollars, <laughs> and then it came out. The companies come forward and say we never heard of it. Yeah, no, we got to stay tuned for more details on that. All right, next clip. Let's get into this. The president-elect Donald Trump was spotted giving some poker advice, admittedly a long time ago, but very relevant because I actually think the advice might be pretty GTO. Let's play this clip we got up here. Look at every situation as a challenge. Use the word challenge all the time. Life is a challenge. Poker is a challenge. Sports is a challenge. Business is a challenge. You know what? If you're competitive and you think in terms of challenge, you'll be much more successful. Over the years, I've learned a lot of things in business and in life. One of the things I like for myself is go with the gut. Some of my best decisions are made that way. But one of the things that I've also learned is some of the best deals I've made are deals I didn't make. 
I've seen deals go bad. If I would have made it, it wouldn't have made a difference. They would have been bad. Some of my best investments have been things that I never did. And that's not so bad. All right, Doug. So let me ask you about this. The, the president-elect's advice Look at every situation as the challenge. Use the word challenge all the time. Life, sports, business. At the game of poker, do you agree that this is a good approach to take? Look at every situation, every hand, everything as a challenge. In general, I would agree. And if you're talking to both of us, we're kind of the challenge guys. Me and you. We, uh, we, we made we, the challenge big. Well, you technically made the prep at challenge big. I, I was inspired by your original idea. And yeah, that's true. You're right. I mean... I'm all about challenging yourself. I think when it comes to doing anything, you challenging yourself. And I think Donald, we've seen this with Donald Trump. He's challenged himself so much at different things over time, you know, doing a pageant, becoming this real estate guy, becoming an allegedly a billionaire, not paying taxes on his, what a billion of dollars for many years. And now he became president. He believed in himself so much from doing all these things over time because he really did embrace a challenge. And I feel like at poker, a lot of people don't embrace the challenge anymore. They don't challenge themselves in bets. They don't challenge themselves against good players. They don't challenge themselves to really do anything special because, oh, it, the games are harder or there's bots or there's this or there's that. It's always a lot of excuses. And I feel like with Donald Trump's advice, if you really take it, everything as a challenge, I feel like it's just going to be a smart way to do it. They don't challenge themselves to play micro stakes on WSOP. You know, these are the things, these are the challenges you have to stand up and take. No, but but seriously. No, who, who could ever win at the micro stakes on WSOP? Who could do that? But anyway, I, I think that it's good overall, but here's kind of my problem with it. The thing is, when you when you say, you know, make everything a challenge, like you're going to win every, everything that you're doing. You know, you're going to do so much winning, et cetera, et cetera. The problem mm -hmm. is, in poker, sometimes, you know, you get dealt a hand that's going to lose. That's going to happen to you a lot, particularly the more people are at the table. And, and sometimes I think you can make mistakes by trying too hard to win individual hands rather than trying to, to do the best, you know, long term. Some of the best hands you ever played are hands you chose not to play to begin with. You know? <laughs> we didn't include that clip in there. So, oh, what so, was the so what the second part he said? He said, when someone challenges you, fight back. Don't be a sucker. They won't play games with you again if you fight back against them. Which is like, I guess, kind of true. I mean, if you show people you're willing to call them down light or you're not going to put up with like these this nonsense. Actually, you know what? I would say this is kind of a cornerstone of the way I always played heads up, which was, you know, put your foot down early. Let them know you're not going to like get pushed around all these spots. If they want to bluff, yeah, they're going to get through sometimes, but they're not going to get through enough. And eventually you're going to dominate them. So I like, I like the approach. Moving on to a different topic about Donald Trump, though. Is he good for poker online? Because... I think, I think that one of his major donators to his campaign is allegedly Sheldon Adelson. Well, though, this isn't allegedly. Actually, Sheldon Adelson is one of the members that did join Trump's inauguration team. Him, Steve Wynn, I believe Phil Ruffin, who's another gambling magnet in Las Vegas. So they're officially on the inauguration team. And from what I was reading, Adelson donated millions of dollars to different Republicans around the country. And I believe many of those Republicans are very strongly against online gambling. So that just cannot be a good sign <laughs> for the future of online poker. Unfortunately, I've read some um, I've read some things on online poker report that said, you know, there is some hope. But if Adelson's involved, I think we've come to learn that. And you. You know, honestly, you would think someone that even had a clip of him talking about poker 10 years ago would be someone that's going to be fairly pro poker. You know, it's America's game. It, I mean, it, I think people generally look at poker as like a test of your wit and skill. Uh, I, I think that generally in, in you know the culture's eyes, poker is looked at in a generally positive light. I mean, sure, there's the gambling aspect that makes it negative, but still, mm -hmm. it's like a game you play with your friends and try and be good. Uh, so I guess we're going to have to see from Trump, but not looking too good. We're going to move on to our next and main story here today on Table Talk. Phil Ivey with his edge sorting scandal at the Borgata at Crockford's. I'm going to kick it over to Joey to give us the rundown. Joey, tell us what happened here so we can All talk right, about so I've been, I've been looking at this way too much. And I've been, I spent, honestly, way too much time reading about the story. Because, you know, everything we know about Phil Ivey, the Tiger Woods of poker... He's, you know, debatably one of the best poker players in the entire world. Great reputation. Everybody loves him. 
And so when the story first came out, I was really interested because I'm like, wait a sec, like what, like what edge shorting? What's happening? You know, I really want to learn more about it. Is he innocent? Is he guilty? Is he getting like who, who's who's wrong? Who's right? So kind of from what I'm understanding is that Phil Ivey and his accomplice Chen Yun Sun, a I believe she's Chinese. So what happens was they end up going to a casino, two casinos. One casino was in the United Kingdom and back in 2012. And how it would work is that Chen Yun Sun would end up speaking, man, it would request a Mandarin dealer. They'd speak Mandarin to each other. And what they would look for is defects in the cards. So they would keep asking for deck changes until they ended up being able to identify some defaulty decks or something like that. And then Chen Yun Sun would then ask the dealer to turn the card an opposite way. And I, I think we talked about this, but I don't know how this is possibly allowed, but they're playing a game called Punta Banco. And Phil Ivey over at the, in the UK, he won 7.8 million euros. And I guess what they happened was they, they, yeah, so they, they only actually gave him back 1 million euro and they kept the rest of the money and they because they suspected something was going on. And then also in 2012 at the Borgata Casino, which, by the way, is very underrated. I love the Borgata. Once again, they pulled the old Punta Banca shuffle on them. And they won, uh, yeah, they won about nine point six million fucking dollars, Doug. The Punta and Banca shuffle. The Punta Banca shuffle, oh, man. Chen man. Young Sun, you bring Chen Young Sun in there. She's got the, uh, uh, the she's the professional card spotter or whatever. So Borgata ends up paying them out. Then the lawsuit happens with the Crockford's place, and then Borgata. Now they filed their own lawsuit asking for fifteen point five million dollars. The nine point six million dollars won back. The two hundred forty nine thousand dollars in comps, and five point four million dollars of expected losses, which is by far the most ridiculous thing about this. Okay, if you're if you're in the casino, and, and to be honest with you, I'm not totally sure what the ruling should be. Like, I'm not a lawyer. I it to be honest with you, it does seem a little sketchy, but possibly within the rules. I mean, the casino did oblige to everything. I'm not totally sure. And I know that our legal system will, will treat this much differently than in the UK. So it remains right. to be seen, even though he lost the Cro Crockford's lawsuit, um, he did not get paid out, and he tried to uh, appeal, did not go through. So basically, we don't we know he's going to lose in the UK. We don't know what's going to happen here uh, in, in at the Borgata. But it's unbelievable to me for the casino to say, okay, not only do you have to pay us back what you won, you also have to pay us back the comps, and then you also have to pay us back what we should have won in House Edge. Well, I'm not sure if they're familiar with how gambling works, but usually when people are gambling, they don't tend to bet huge when they're losing. You know, oftentimes if you're, if you're gambling, and albeit this is different because he had an edge and they were using a defect in the decks to get this edge. But when you're gambling, you're going to increase your bet size as you're winning. And so I think for a lot of people, if they had to pay back House Edge on winnings, the number gets to be totally ridiculous, and it wouldn't have been that high to begin with if they'd been losing. Yeah, so kind of what I've been reading is that they're kind of coming in high. So they're hoping for a settlement. So they're going to come in at this higher number. They're going to ask for this ridiculous thing of $5.4 million back and the expected losses from the hands that they played over these four sessions. And I guess maybe the main goal is to settle just and get their money back. And by the way, $249,000 in comps for four times. Doug, what, what exactly... I mean, obviously, you know, a guy like you, as we learned from your Paul Fua video, a man with millions of dollars, what exactly is $249,000 in comps? What, what can you buy? Like, what is he? Is he getting blood? I, I, don't, I don't even, I can't even make up a joke to understand what he could possibly be spending $250,000 on comps. I have to imagine that there's some sweets involved, some popping bottles involved, some, some very, very, very nice dinners involved. I mean, I don't know, man. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of cheddar. What kind of club? Maybe, 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 maybe private jet to and from there. Private jet. Okay, I could see that. I mean, listen, right. I've been in the Borgata Club. There's absolutely no way you're spending more than $1,000 at that club on any given night. Uh, but it's a nice club. But, yeah, maybe a private jet, shout something to, like shout that. Shout out to the Borgata Club. I mean, listen, it's a nice club. It's down escalators. But there's no way you're spending two hundred four nine thousand dollars at the Borgata nightclub downstairs. So but kind of what I was thinking is that, you know, does this bring into question maybe some other things, Phil Ivy? You know, he's obviously he's had a lot of success on Full Tilt Poker. He had a graph go straight up for $20 million ever since Black Friday and Full Tilt happened. Seems like you can't really win online poker anymore. 
I mean, should you feel like, is there something we should come into question? He's been a live player for a long time. Obviously, you know, he's probably looking for edges and, and maybe it's a good or bad, thing, you know, right or wrong. Who knows? But do you think it brings into question maybe a little bit of uh, some other things he might have been involved with? I mean, there's no, there's no doubt Phil Ivey's a hustler. You know, when you're at the table with him, he's always trying to figure out what you're up to, what's going on. And you can tell he's very pointed with, with like what he's trying to figure out and what he's trying to accomplish. But... You know, online poker kind of takes away that side of things. Like, I don't think there's too much sketchy stuff that can really go down online poker outside of someone, you know, putting a Trojan on your computer and then, you know, well, I've been there. But anyway, the point is, I don't think it calls that into question. And as you can see, like, l lately in the last few years, he's getting crushed online because the games has gotten so much tougher. You know, when I, I was, I just did some, some videos on, like, the, the top big pots from back in the day. And those lineups were soft, man. 501k was just straight up soft. Like, there'd be like a couple spots at the table that were like serious spots. It's not that hard to win when you're in games w when the lineup is that easy. Hmm. That definitely makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I don't think that's a big serious concern by people in terms of the online integrity of the situation on full tilt, but I, mean, I don't know. You know, it's always something that I think I've talked with some friends about and you can't argue with the results. You go up, you go down. I, I just, the game didn't change that much, really, right? So. It has, it's changed a lot. Yeah, I guess we're going to find out exactly what's going to happen with the Borgata situation. We'll be staying up to date with that. And um, I think that ends our, our, our main kind of segment there. Doug, you want to – what do we got for buy and sell? You got a flashy graphic here to put up? And, All right, uh, so, so we're going to introduce you guys to the section ooh. buy or sell. And the way it's going to work, we're going to come up with a topic. We're either going to buy or sell that topic, stock in that topic. And, uh, yeah, you want to just go ahead and jump right into this? Man, I'm excited for Here this Here we go. One. This Let's is go. your boy. This is your boy. I'll let you intro this Mar one. Marvelous. Marvelous. Doug, buy or sell in stock in the one of the most famous poker players in the entire world. Mr. Like a Boss, Mr. Coconuts, Mr. Marvelous, Mr. How Far to Hollywood, William Kasub. Is he going to be around the poker world in one year from now? Buy or selling stock in that? Okay, so he's obviously going to be around because he plays poker. He's going to be here. But I'm selling him as a long-term icon. I think he's going to be one and done. I think people are going to remember this main event run. Because, look, here's the thing. When someone goes deep in the main, they get airtime on TV. They get a lot of people there. Everyone gets really into it. And we saw that with Kasuf. He helped bring back, I'm, I don't even know if I want to say the word villain, but kind of almost a villain to some people and a hero to others. But he made poker interesting in that way. Here's the problem. He has no ways to get his word out there, really, other than running deep in tournaments. And you can't just run deep constantly in tournaments unless your name is Fedor Holes. And even then, Fedor Holes is getting his tele televised time. Listen, Doug, I'm buying all the stock you got in William Gassouf. I feel like this guy is a... He's really chasing after it, too. He's doing a lot of podcasts. He's a professional retweeter on Twitter of all the nice comments things said. The people love him. I'm seeing some of these people. They fucking love this guy. He's bringing back excitement to poker. He's talking it up. He made up, like, 55 catchphrases. You, we, Me and you only made up, like, seven in our lives. I mean, I don't – he made up 55 in one little thing. So Look, I'm with you. Good for poker. But I'm not with you. He's not going to be here in a year or two. Unless, unless he just bangs off winning a bunch of tournaments – his overall presence is going to die down dramatically. You can't be deep in the World Series of Poker Main every year. You can't. Listen, Doug, I'm buying all the stock you got. If he, if he was on a stock exchange right now, I would be buying everything. I feel like he's going to keep getting better at his game. He's a smart guy, former lawyer. I see him sticking around. So all right, next, uh, next topic here. Let's move over to Poker Stars stock. Buy or sell long-term. Jo long -term. Joey, who you, what you got here? Buy or sell? Uh, you know what, Doug? I don't give a fuck how much money this stock would make me. I'm selling all my PokerStar stock. I, I just, I don't want to be on PokerStar's island. It's not looking good. I feel like PokerStars is trying to change what poker means. They're trying to use these sports stars like a Ronaldo and like a Neymar to bring in these new poker, new players who aren't really familiar with poker or what online poker is at all. They're trying to bring these new players in, send them to these games that they can't beat raise the rate consistently, lower the rewards, lower the amount of you know smart people who are going to be playing because they realize they can't win. Basically, they're trying to turn poker into this candy crush, into this Facebook game. And I don't want to be a part of it. I'm, I'm selling. I'm, I can't. Okay, look, 
I'm actually going to buy, but oh, but not but not because of the current situation. Okay, get out of here. here's what's going to happen: the Amaya stock is going to continue to drop. Poker Stars is going to continue to do worse. It's going to get worse and worse for them. And what's going to happen is someone's going to buy them out. They're going to get bought out by a different person, a different company, and Ooh. that company is going to know to treat the customers right. As long as David Bazoff is part of this, it's a sinking ship. There's no way. It's, it's just it's a sinking ship. But long term. Poker Stars has a massive place in the poker ecosystem, and it would only take them fixing some of these problems to be a great long-term buy. Also, probably undervalued right now because of all the decisions that they've made. Uh-oh, people are going to go, wait, is that Isai Scheinberg music I hear out there? He might be coming back. You think he's over on the Isle of Man, walking around the coffee shops of Isle of Man, I mean, looks it, at his product, what his dream became, and he's like, I need to get back in this he thing. Came back, it, it would be the single best thing for online poker of all time. Single best thing. But I put that percentage at 15%. He comes back. All right. All right, Doug. Next topic here. American poker. American. Okay, let's go focus on legalized American poker. Buy or selling stock in that. Unfortunately, I'm selling. And the Donald Trump thing is just one reason why I'm selling. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's state level stuff, there's federal level stuff. There's probably gonna be some local level stuff at some point down the road. So really you have to get this pass at all, in all kinds of different places to make it work. Here's the thing though. When I see American poker, California represents like 25, 30% of total rake paid uh, according to pre-Black Friday numbers. If California gets through, it would be massive for online poker. But every time they try, it gets blocked. Now, I know we got a bunch of people that are the eternal optimists. California poker is going to be here, man. Bro, it's going to be awesome, man. No, it's, coming. it's not coming. <laughs> All right, so I've been doing some research on these tribes in California. i got to say, California is a fucked up state. So they have these hundreds of Indian tribes that essentially control how the po political stuff, what laws go into place. And it doesn't look like, you know, I've heard rumors 2018, 2019, but it doesn't really look like from what I've been reading is that they're very close on working anything out. Now, it does look like potentially New York is a bit more positive in terms of something getting passed next year. I think there's a couple other states as well where a bill that maybe in Illinois or a Pennsylvania has been discussed as well. But I really think that I I'm definitely not buying stock, first of all, but <laughs> I'm definitely selling stock. I don't it just it seems like there's way too much happening with the Trump stuff for a national level even with what we've seen so far, you know, and also PokerStars is involved. And I really like how PokerStars, their their entire approach, they're trying oh, to win so American bad. players over by doing these good things. And then they're just kind of shitting on some of these other players over here. It's very, I find it- They, they helped block poker in California. You know that, right? A lock on poker in they, California? No, they, they helped block poker in California. They lobbied to stop California online poker because yeah, it wasn't going to include yeah, poker stars. Out. Yeah, of course they did. It, it wasn't going out. to. They don't care about online poker. They care about poker stars. I think we've obviously, they don't give All a right. fuck about online poker. I think we've come to realize that. So. All right, moving on. Kui win. Winner of the World Series of Poker main event this year. Is he here to stay? Is he good for poker? What's your take here, Joey? All right, Doug. Now, first of all, that hat. Is amazing. I, I love that Guardians of Galaxy raccoon hat. I'm buying that Guardian, Guardians of Galaxy raccoon hat. I'm buying Key Win being good for poker. I'm buying Key Win. No, I'm kidding. I'm selling Key. There, come on, Key Win. It can be. Let's let's be real for a second. But I'm buying Key Win good for poker because he took it. He made poker fun again. You know, I got guys at the gym saying, "Hey, you know, you see the you see the heads up main event on TV. Key, that guy played awesome. He's playing aggressive. He's taking it to the streets. And we know me and you, we love street poker." We love taking into the streets. We love playing some power poker. And I feel like Key Win is going to influence a lot of people out there to maybe pick up that style, to say, hey, you know what? I can win. I can still win. I don't need to be this fucking GTO guy or this, this young guy who, who doesn't talk much at the table. I can win, man. What do you think, Doug? Um, so I, I think he's definitely good for poker. Uh, by the way, Joey, can you lower your speaker volume just a little bit? It's creating sure. an echo. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm buying Kui Win long run in poker. Uh, or sorry, I'm buying Kui Win for how good it is for poker. You know, this shows that someone can come up, they can be aggressive, they can make some moves, they can put Gordon Vale in spots, and, and they can win the main event. I think it's great. I think it's, I'm glad to have someone that's not just some 20-year-old, whatever, 20-whatever-year-old online pro 
winning the main again. It's happened a bunch of times in a row, and it was time for some fresh blood. I like that. I was rooting for Johnny Bax, but what are you going to do? Anyway, the point is, I think this is great for poker, but is he going to be here long term? It's the same thing, man. What's he going to do? What's he honestly going to do? Mm, Baccarat. No? You don't think that can stick him around? Well, I mean, that, I mean, sure, but that's not keeping him around, man. Yeah. All right. We'll see what happens at Key. I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I hope he sticks around, so. We got a graphic for this next one, too? We do. Uh, lower the speaker volume a little bit more, man. All right. We are live, technically. Stars and technical difficulties, but my speaker is low. I don't have it up at all. All right. So we'll figure it Maybe out later. We'll hang out stuff. We'll have to figure it out for next time. All right. Go for it here. All right. This day in poker history is going to be none other than... One of the most popular poker players in the world, Isildur won on this day or month rather. Back in what seven years ago, Doug, Isildur won went on one of his massive upswings. He, I think he won about you know six, seven, eight million dollars playing high stakes. And then November was the hottest month of all time. And then unfortunately, he got chopped down by Team Brian Hastings, my buddy Brian Hastings, for four point two million dollars. And that sort of was the uh, the beginning of the fall. That was the Isildur one upswing. Yeah, and actually it's interesting because he's on a big upswing lately, although I think yesterday he might have gotten pummeled for a bunch, so I'm not sure where he's at currently. But I think when people look back at that run, when they look back at those games, um, I think that's maybe even the iconic poker moment online, right? It mm -hmm. had the most people watching. It was on Real Heaven. It had everyone talking about it on the forums. I, I really think that it gave, it gave online poker such life to have something like that going on which is why i'm kind of sad that we have such a disappearance of these nosebleed games where people won and lost millions of dollars you know that was great that was just great for poker i mean it was also probably great for full tilt because you get people over to full tilt to play in the same side as their heroes but it was great for poker i'm a little disappointed just to not see that type of stuff nowadays it's definitely something that i'm going to miss when i look back at online poker yeah i mean those times back then you look at the threads on two plus two there's hundreds of posts on there. There's people who were so excited, so engaged. But I mean, it makes sense. You have Isildur battling with some of the most well-known poker players, the Durs, the, the Brian Hastings, Brian Townsend, Phil Ivey, all these poker legends he was battling with on a consistent basis at the highest stakes. So you know, it makes sense that it was, was such an interesting thing. Plus, this fearless guy, this unknown Swedish, just playing six tables, eight tables, heads up, three opponents. Oh, my God. That was for so hours. It, 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 is, it, it was amazing. It really it, was. It's disgusting to think about nine tabling heads up at 501K. Do you think that was a big inspiration for you when you were, because you, you were on that time, you were, you were making your way up. Do you feel like you watching that really inspired you to want to get to play those games, which you have actually, which you ended up playing? You ended up do, playing the 400, 800, the 500, 1Ks. But do you feel like you seeing those games was something that really maybe even pushed the motivation for you to another level? You know, I remember at the time thinking, like, my God, I wish I had more money so I could play in these games. Um, I don't know if that game specifically gave me the motivation. I think it was just more of just my, my drive in, in one game format. Um, I didn't really rail those games that, that much. I just saw what the community what the community had to say about it. And mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe, maybe sub subconsciously a little bit just to see that happen. But I'm not sure about that. Mm. All, All right, right, guys. We got our... We got our final final thing, our final unnamed rundown. We're, we're moving on to the final rundown. Opening Let's it up, Joey, it. take it away. All right, Twitter politics. I, I, I Rest in peace. I can't believe it's over. And also, Twitter introduced an option to block words. I've blocked all Trumps and all Twitter politics from my thing. Here's my question. If you're Daniel Negreanu, what are you going to do now? What, where, Hockey, where, where are all your soccer. hours going? All I right, have, I over. No idea Isler, 2016, go. we just talked about a little bit. The heater is back. On the upswing, crushing people, playing one or two hundred PLO. Joey, you taking Isler one, running it back up to the nosebleeds. I am taking. Uh, yes, I'm in. I want to see it. I don't care. I'm going to stay positive. I think that we're going to see Isler one go back up five ten, thirty five million. I'm not sure. Doug, GPL finals. The playoffs are starting. They're going to be live in Vegas. I know you're in Vegas. You're going to be going. What team you got? Who you rooting for? Who's in it? What are the team names? I don't know anything about, you know what? I'm taking the Las Vegas money makers because money making, money All making. Right. I'm in. All in Las Vegas money makers. Durr spied in Macau in the Triton High Roller with Jungle winning that tournament. Can you say awkward? 
Yeah, it's a little awkward. I mean, obviously those two have a big history. They've had a prop bet that's been going on for 35 years. I, I don't know if they talk. I, I can't even imagine the dynamic between the two of those as they're sitting there at the table. <laughs> eight year anniversary, guys. So eight year anniversary, shout out to me, by the way. I played 600,000 hands, my first prop bet, November 2008, 16 hour days. Oh, it was a great time. And eat, I'm so sleep, happy that, uh, eat, sleep, PLO. Eat, sleep, PLO. No, this is no limit hold'em, man. This is no, no limit hold'em. Hold Yes. You won. you actually took my idea and you actually won. Congrats on that. Moving on Thank over. You. I am currently in my Bangroll challenge and it's yeah. looking less and less optimistic by the minute. That said, I am up I'm up to 237, Joey. I'm Let's doing go, it. Let's go, baby. I'm doing Doug, big things. I, I mean, I think in eight years when you finally win this prop bet challenge, it's going to be one of the most glorious moments of all time. And we need to throw the biggest party of all time in Vegas. All right. All right, guys, thank you for joining us here for Table Talk. If you want to find this episode, you can find it on Joe Ingram 1's channel. We're also going to be back next week, 11 a.m. PST, 2 p.m. Uh, EST, 8 p.m. Central European time. 35 time, Australian Eastern time. Australian Eastern time. I don't know if that's true at all. But, guys, let us know what you thought about the show. Give us feedback. If we made a mistake, let us know. We'd love to hear more. And uh, that's it. That's all we got. Doug, part parting words? Thank you for joining us here today. And I hope, I hope this comes a running tradition. I hope we can make this a thing. Do you guys like this? Is this a good thing? Let's do it again. <laughs> Next <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> Happy right, Thanksgiving, everybody. everyone, by the way. I'll see you all later. Take care. Peace. Thank you for watching the debut episode of Table Talk. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel for future episodes, and comment below. And let me and Doug know what you thought about our first episode. I want you guys to check out Doug's new video about Paul Fua and Paul Fua's mysterious YouTube channel, which includes a conversation with Tom Dwan of all people. So go check it out right here, right there, probably right there. And stay tuned for episodes next week.